Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, no matter where you are on this planet. Uh, I want to welcome you to the 75th anniversary celebration of the ENIAC. I am Vijay Kumar, the Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Science at the University of Pennsylvania. It's simply a great honor here to be with you on ENIAC Day, almost 75 years to the day after the ENIAC was unveiled by, by Presper Eckert Jr. and John W. Mockley. Today we celebrate not only the scientific and the technological accomplishments that marked the ENIAC, but also the history of computer architecture and the first programmers, the women of ENIAC and innovation sparked by ENIAC, which led to the EDVAC, the microprocessor, today's FPGAs and accelerators, and so many advances in computing at the edge and the cloud, autonomous cars, large-scale distributed systems, the list goes on and on. Indeed, it was 10 years ago, again, almost to the day that the city of Philadelphia declared February 15th, ENIAC Day in Philadelphia, a day in which the city celebrates, and I quote, the use of computers and advances in digital technology and seeks to bridge the digital divide across Philadelphia, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and the nation, end quote. I want to thank my colleagues, led by Professor Andre Dehan, for putting together an exciting agenda for this celebration, the agenda that combines our nostalgic reminder of the 30-ton, 18,000 vacuum tube computing machine with the inspiration provided by the women of ENIAC, and today's innovative research being carried out on the Penn campus. And it's my greatest privilege to kick off this agenda by introducing you to our keynote speaker, Dr. David Patterson, the party professor of computer science emeritus at the University of California at Berkeley. It's with no exaggeration that I say that Professor Patterson is the leading computer architect and educator of the past several decades. Professor Patterson is the winner of the ACM Turing Award, which he won in 2017, for among other accomplishments for developing RISC, the Reduced Instruction Set Computing Architecture. He's the recipient of the IEEE von Neumann Medal and the ACM IEEE Eckert Markley Award. He's been elected to the member of the National Academy of Engineering. Okay. He's been elected to the member of the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Patterson is a fellow of the Association for Computing Machinery, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and the American Society of the Advancement of Science. I could easily go on with this long and impressive list of recognitions, but instead I'll stop here by reminding all of us that he also wrote the definitive undergraduate and graduate textbooks on computer architecture. I simply cannot imagine a better person to launch this event. Please join me in virtually welcoming Dr. David Patterson to our Zoom session. Thank you. That was a very generous and long introduction. <laughs> uh, let me try and share my screen. Oh, no, let's see. Am I already sharing my screen? Is it, uh, let's see. No. Okay, I will hopefully, you see it now? Perfect. Yes. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is do some history and uh, talk a little bit about today and the future, and including my ties to this event personally. Okay. And I'm going to get everybody on board. I don't know who the audience is, but let's assume some people don't have PhDs in computer science. So when software talks to hardware, it has a vocabulary. And the words of that vocabulary are called instructions. And the technical name for that vocabulary is instruction set architecture, usually abbreviated ISA. It's the most important interface in the computer because it determines the software that can run on that hardware. And in fact, um, PC and smartphone software is distributed in these instructions. So what do these instructions look like? They're actually a lot like the keys of a calculator. 
uh, a computer is like a calculator. It has a keyboard for input, display for output, and the instructions have these keys. Like the keys, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. You remember when you use a calculator, you don't want to write a number down and bring it back. You can store it in memory is what it's called. And there's a memory in computers as well, and those instructions are called log and store. And so what a program is, it's just thousands to millions of these instructions like add, subtract, uh, and then you execute them at billions of times per second. Now, what will actually, yeah, let me do one more. And, but programming at this level is tedious. It's called machine language because it's the language of the machine. But shortly after computers were invented, they invented what were called high-level programming languages that would make it easier for humans to write programs. And then they translators, which they called compilers, that would translate what people is easy to write into machine instructions. And so, for example, if you wanted to take B divided by C and add D and store it in E, that is one line in high-level languages, and it generates these seven machine language instructions below. All right, now, now let's go to, uh, and, and it's often one language, one line of high-level languages, five to 10 of these machine language. Okay, so let me do a little history stuff. In the textbook that John Hennessy and I wrote, we really like history, so we have an online appendix that you can check on afterwards. So Maurice Wilkes was one of the computer pioneers that lived a long time. He, he died at 99 years old, but we got to know Maurice Wilkes, and so, he, and he, told us about what it was like at the beginning because he was there. So, uh, and he's one of our heroes. So Eckert and Mockley were Wilkes's heroes. Uh, so the what's really kind of amazing about all this in this event is the biggest idea that came out of this work at ENIAC is what's called the stored program computer. And actually when I visited Penn in the early, in late 1970s as a new PhD, Somebody talked, took me into the ENIAC room or the, the pieces that were there and they explained to me. And so I talked about the memory part. And so the ENIAC had memory that you could put the, the numbers in. But the claim was that somebody said, you know what you should do instead of this program, which was actually, like I said, the keys of the calculator that were kind of hardwired in, you should keep the program like data. And that inside is called the stored program computer. And what that means is computers can change the program they're running instant, basically in fractions of a second rather than you have to rewire it. So the big idea wasn't the ENIAC, the big idea was the stored program computer. So what's amazing about this piece of history is we know where it happened, it happened right there at Penn. And we know when it happened, I think it was the summer or something like that of 1945. I'm not sure of the dates, but it's, we know when, but we don't know who did it. There's controversy about who came up with the idea of the stored program. So uh, after they did the ENIAC for the Army during World War II, the next thing was to do a stored program computer. It was called the EDSAC. Uh, what, and so what they did generously is they offered kind of summer school courses. So Maurice Wilkes, my hero, got on the Queen Mary, came from England, took a series of lectures that Eckert and Mockley and others taught explaining how to build a stored program computer that they were going to construct underway. Um, and then around this same time, this report to the right by Burks, Goldstein, and von Neumann is a description that was published in 1946 that is a, a brilliant uh, writing to describe what, like how do you build a computer? How do you build a computer? It's, and it's still the, uh, it's still, we quote it in our textbook. It's just a great, description of what the issues are in designing the computer. Well, you notice that report does not have Eckert and Mockley's name on it. Um, so that was a problem. And what I was told uh, by Maurice Wilkes was that they were in a meeting, Eckert and Mockley and von Neumann, and they confronted him and said, why didn't you put our names in the report? And he, he didn't answer it. Uh, what I've read about von Neumann is that he, he a genius for sure, but what he was really great at wasn't so much inventing, but a, a taking an idea and making it tremendously better. But certainly Eckert and Mockley and von Neumann get credit. Uh, and my, according to my heroes, they were the ones who did it. And von Neumann wrote this brilliant paper, but you know, this is, I'm sure that people will talk about it today. 
1947, Eckert and Walkley got into a fight because they wanted to file the patent for one of the greatest inventions of all time, the stored programming computer, and Penn wanted to keep the patent. So they quit and founded the Eckert Walkley Computer Corporation to build the EDSAC. Well, you can imagine this slowed things down. So Maurice Wilkes, after learning how to build a computer, went back to the Queen Mary and at Cambridge said, I'm going to build one. And so he built the Ed SAC, and that's considered the first really general purpose stored program computer because uh, the, the Ed VAC was, although it was eventually built, it slowed down. Uh, now, let me also point out that Grace Mary Hopper, one of the heroes of computing, one of my heroes too, <laughs> of computing, she developed one of the most influential programming languages at the time on the EDSAC. Um, and then uh, I also should mention that Project World One at MIT, it came a few years later than what was going on, but they did a lot of innovative things. And particularly they did what's called the core memory, the magnetic core memory. And what Maurice Wilkes told us was the problem with the computers that area is the memory, these the mercury delay the lines were very unreliable. So you really couldn't, they, you couldn't make a commercial product out of it. He said the core memory changed everything and suddenly you could build commercial products. Eckert and Mockley's corporation was acquired by Sperry Mann and they brought out the UNIVAC. And I, I can remember people talking about UNIVAC. It was like Kleenex. And they didn't talk to call them computers, they called them UNIVACs, but it, it made tremendous attention when the UNIVAC came out. IBM entered the game a few years later and brought out their own computers um, and then soon took over the market. Okay, so let's go another, forward another decade and IBM had this problem. They actually had four different lines of computers, each with their own vocabularies or instruction sets, each with their own software systems and different markets. And so this is 10 years later and the engineers at IBM make this bet that they think they could come up with a single instruction set that would unify these four independent lines. And they called it the IBM System 360. Now, the problem then and now with designing computers isn't the, the data path, the number crunching piece of it, kind of the brawn, it's the brains, the control that tells you how to do things. So how are they gonna get these four independent companies inside of IBM to agree on a common instruction set? Well, Maurice Wilkes, uh, that we mentioned earlier, one of our heroes and the second winner of the Turing Award, invented this idea of the specifying control in a matrix, which meant you could implement it out of a memory system that made it uh, much easier to do. It was more like programming, so he called it microprogramming. So IBM decided to bet the company they could do one instruction set, and they've used microprogramming. You're building a little interpreter in the machine for all these different machines. So in April 1964, they announced a family of computers all with the same instruction set that, that varied the data path from 8 bits to 64 bits and the speed of the memories, and they varied in cost by about a factor of eight as well. And IBM bet the company on that idea, and IBM won that bet. They just completely dominated computing for the next decade. And Fred Brooks, another Turing Award winner, was the architect of that project. Now we get into what are called mini computers and instead of using vacuum tubes, you're using transistors. So now everything's kind of the same speed and we have Moore's law on our side. So the integrated circuits are getting bigger all the time and with bigger memory, you could have more complicated instruction sets, which I call SIS for complicated instruction set computer. And here's an example of the VAX, which was a very popular one, which has much bigger microcode for the bigger instruction set. Now we talk about microprocessors. Once we had enough transistors in the integrated circuits, so we actually build a whole processor that became very exciting, a single chip processor. Now, but these are pretty mundane things and they were just, the companies like Intel that were building microprocessors would just imitate what the mainframe people did because they didn't really understand computer architecture. But Gordon Moore had this insight that the next instruction set they did in the 1970s Intel would be stuck with that instruction set for the rest of the company's life. So he hired a bunch of PhDs in computer science, sent them up to Oregon to invent the next great instruction set. And it's an amazingly ambitious project. They had 8-bit computers then. They didn't do 16-bit computers, they did 32-bit computers. They did what's called capability-based addressing, object-oriented architecture, and even wrote their own operating system in an exotic new language. Well, that was very ambitious, but it was, they had big problems. It didn't fit on one chip. 
it had performance problems, so they had to go back and call Glorm more. We're not going to be ready in time for you to have a 16-bit microprocessor. So Intel started an emergency project, and they gave the team 52 weeks to invent a new instruction set and build a microprocessor and have it on the weekend. So with 52 weeks, they spent three whole weeks designing the instruction set, but they did it. They came out, not too much fanfare, but the great news for Intel is that IBM decided to get into the personal computer market with Apple, and they picked Intel's design for it to be used in that. So what did that mean? Well, the good news is that the 86 is going to be successful, so it's IBM expected 250,000 a year, which would be fine. But IBM screwed that up. They were wrong. It was 100 million. So suddenly the 86 became a huge success, and suddenly this instruction set that they spent three weeks designing became incredibly valuable because you wanted to be compatible with PC software because of the gigantic sales. So now, uh, next step, we're going to start talking, looking at these instruction sets with, based on this microcoded interpreter. Well, I, another change happened that now we're in the 1970s is compilers are now the source of our measurements. So everybody's writing in high level languages. Before, some things weren't written in high level languages, particularly operating systems, and the system called the Unix demonstrated that even the operating systems could. So now, what people cared about was the language. So a group uh, led by I, John Cock at IBM, who was also a Turing Award winner, he had ideas of, of building these simple processors, and, but he had really great compiler technology. So he used it for this IBM mainframe instruction set that saved the company, but he only used the simple instructions. He didn't use the complicated ones, even though they had the micro do that. And it ran up to three times faster by using the simple instructions. And another influential study was done at the place where they built the VAX mini computer. They looked at that very complicated VAX instruction set and found the average instruction time was a lot longer than they thought, 10 cycles rather than five. But when they looked at the microcode, 20% of those instructions, which was 60% of the microcode, were almost never used. So that also called into question these complex instructions. So that sets up the transition from reduced from complex instruction set computer to reduced instruction set computer. Instead of the memory having this microcode interpreter, the instead would be what's called a cache of user visible instructions. And so you could change it to whatever the application needs. And they kept the instruction set simple, almost as simple as the micro instructions, just not as wide as they were. And it's enabled what's called pipeline execution, where you overlap the execution and they run much more efficiently. And then, by the way, uh, you didn't use very many of those complicated instructions anyway, so what were you, what were you giving up? And so this that was the idea behind uh, RISC, but it was very controversial because what people had hoped by having these complex instructions that the software would be that ran on top of it would be better. And so when we wrote the first paper, the people from DEC wrote a, a rebuttal at the same time and and say basically instruct. A simple instruction set is less complicated, but that doesn't mean from a systems perspective. Well, which is a very reasonable thing to say, but it was still controversial five years later. And as this article said, they even put controversially in the title, uh, oversimplified, overstated, and misleading. So that there was a school of thought that what we were doing was dangerous. So how, how did risk eventually win? Well, what we realized is by coming up with formulas and collecting data that we could make the argument more quantitative. Uh, John Hennessy and I would appear in debates and there'd be most of the people on one side, but debates at these conferences, they go to a series of conferences and after a couple of years that we started winning them around. And what really turned the tide was when the people from DEC that built the VAX wrote a paper saying using this formula for fair comparisons, this complicated instruction set, you don't need to execute as many instructions, say three fourths as many, but the average instruction times are six times slower. So the net was that risk was about four times faster. Uh, and then uh, kind of the way people wrote textbooks and kind of design computers of time was mostly based on experience and intuition. So uh, John and I wrote a textbook where we tried to make it more like physics and that we put a bunch of equations like the ones above so that you could 
guess how well the machine would run before you built it rather than using your intuition. And the inside cover had a bunch of formulas like that. And this slide is kind of why Hennessy and I won the Turing Award was kind of this, the risk stuff and then the textbook that kind of put that all together. Okay, so what happened in CIS versus RISC? Well, in the personal computer area, the engineers at Intel didn't take it laying down because their instruction set was very valuable because of all the PC software. So remarkably, what they did, because their semiconductor technology was two years ahead of everybody else, they used that extra resources to actually translate from CIS instructions to RISC instructions in the hardware on the fly. And then any good risk idea they could use after it's been translated. And then PC sales got up to 350 million a year. So that instruction set eventually dominated servers as well as desktops. But we're in the post PC era now, it's ever since the iPhone in 2007, and then people are storing data in the cloud. So now instead of buying microprocessors, you get what's called intellectual property. That is, you get a design from somebody, put it in the chip yourself that goes in your phone. And we can't afford uh, the extra translation steps x86 needs. So they value the size of the chip and energy because it's running on battery. And so that extra cost for the complicated instruction set was unaffordable. So it's more than 20 billion a year, not million a year. And uh, almost all of them use risk today. So that's what happened. So that's kind of bringing us to today. Where are we? What's going on now? Well, the big shock is after 50 years, Moore's law is failing us. Uh, it's no longer true. So this shows Intel was off. So he, he made a prediction in 1965 about doubling transistors, and now it's not happening. That's shocking to computer designers because that was a big error. We're in the post Moore's law era. Uh, less well understood, but equally important idea is the end of Bernard scaling. And this IBM engineer made the observation, how are we doubling the number of transistors that goes in a chip every year? Why doesn't the chip roll, roll, roll up, uh, get just it gets so hot? And the reason was we would lower the threshold voltage that decides whether there's a zero or one and power is to the square of that. So power would stay flat, even though you put a lot more transistors in it. And as you can see in the mid uh, 2000s there, it started to go up, that's the blue line. The power started going up because the NARD scaling stopped working. So that means we're limited by power. We're getting, so the transistors aren't as good and power is a big limit. So that's where we are today. And computer designers like Andre and I, as far as we know, the only path forward is domain specific architectures or domain specific accelerators. We get this high efficiency by tailoring it to a particular application. So before, they were general purpose microprocessors designed to run everything well. And for decades, we were able to do that. We can't do that anymore. So example would be graphics or machine learning or image compression. And so what we expect today and going forward is we're going to have these heterogeneous accelerators that tied for individual things you do. So the performance gains will be unequal. And then a thing that I'm involved in, uh, if you look back historically, instruction sets always came from companies and companies own them. So a little over 10 years ago, a group of us at Berkeley decided to do another risk architecture for our research. I had led four of those efforts in the 1980s and my colleague Christian Zanovich said, let's do a new one, new clean and learning from the mistakes of the past for our teaching and research. We make it open so that other academic academics could use our ideas too. We could all share that. There wasn't that much pickup from academics, but suddenly about four years later, we started getting questions from industry about it. And so why do you care about our research instruction set? And basically there was a thirst for an open instruction set that everybody could use. Once we understood that, we decided to try and make it happen. So what I'll show you now is uh, we're kind of five years into this trying to make it happen. And this is a video we did for the 10th anniversary of RISC-V. Uh, we couldn't have a party, so we did it via video. So let's see, hope this works. Last about three minutes. RISC-V needs a theme song. You know, something like we built this city or something that has that energy because that's what I feel. I see passion and dedication and an emotional attachment to RISC-V throughout our community that is so energizing. 
that for those who haven't joined the community yet, come on in. It's a really, really powerful place to be. I mean, I'm actually quite impressed. I think the kind of energy that is going into it and the way you have brought so many parties together is absolutely marvelous. All computers run programs at, at the very lowest level, they need to have a common lingua franca. If there is a lingua franca, then we can start building standard computers. Computers are getting themselves embedded into every aspect of our life. And for that, you need computers that are open so that people can standardize on something. And RISC-V with its open ISA is the only option that is available if computing is to become all pervasive. You can't build a society on proprietary foundations. The key differentiator for risk five from other processes is the openness, uh, the fact that you don't need to sign any agreement whatsoever to just start using it. With this, you can just download it. You don't have to ask anyone's permission. And that is a fantastic difference. Now that I'm doing uh, an architect, I use risk five and I get so many things for free. I can focus on adding value on a few instructions and leverage tens of millions, or hundreds of millions of dollars invested in risk five over the last 10 years. You go that much further by being able to leverage that infrastructure. We had a workshop where we announced that we are going to put risk five in every GPU and every chip that we have. Starting this year, 95% of uh, resources are put in uh, risk back development. When Western Digital announced uh, we were going to transition a billion cores, I essentially tried to replicate that momentum that IBM's billion dollar investment did to Linux with RISC V. Today, RISC V is a movement that can no longer be stopped. The conversation started to change to why not use RISC V as opposed to the early years where it was like, why the hell would I use something other than what I've always been using? Risk five is the Linux of the processor architecture world. It's the transformation to an open source platform that allows many, many more innovators and inventors to contribute to the advance of the technology. I think of ARM as a company that has paved the way for Risk Five. It is always destined to act as a place filler in the history of computing, as a precursor to Risk Five. There is an immense opportunity for RISC V to be in five years the leading ISA for computing. I mean, it seems to be incredible, but it doesn't look so impossible now. Okay. So uh, RISC V has, uh, in, in more than 50 countries now, and with thousands of people participating in uh, extending it. So basically, uh, you know, after putting this video together, it gave me time to think, and I, I really think it is going to, in five years, just be the most dominant construction set. The thing to keep in mind is most of these risk construction sets are kind of all about the same. They're within 10% of each other. Risk five is free. It's very expensive to get a license, maybe $10 million plus royalties. You can get risk five from several sources rather than one source when it's proprietary. And there's even open source implementations, which is a new exciting opportunity, sometimes usually from universities, but sometimes from companies. The other thing that happens with proprietary instruction sets is somebody can buy them. <laughs> Nobody can buy RISC V, it belongs to a foundation, but uh, ARM is in the newspapers about NVIDIA buying them. And then countries are worried about their computers. So, uh, what's inside their computers in their government or the defense? So India has picked risk five so that it can build its own chips and not rely on anybody else. We allow these custom instructions where older instruction sets don't do that. And uh, we can, it, usually instruction sets, it's like middle age, you just get bigger and bigger and bigger, things keep growing. But risk five lets you optionally uh, add things you want and you don't have to include them. And we're catching up and the, uh, the older ones have a better ecosystem that we're catching up. So with that, let me wrap up and see if we, there's time for questions. So we're celebrating the stored program computer, one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century. We know where it happened, when it happened. We're not quite sure who happened. You know, a startup that came out of Penn developed the first commercial computer, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, the kind of getting into things I was talking about, this microcoded machines with these complicated instruction sets, dominated from the 1960s to the end of the PC era. And now 
there's no Moore's law or it's ending and democracy currently is gone. It dominates today. The risk instructed set is the current era and uh, the future, the main specific architectures and this exciting idea about an open instruction set. And with that, I'm ready to uh, ask, answer questions if we have time. Okay. Oh, David, uh, thanks, thanks for that talk. And I think we have one question in the chat for you and I'm gonna put a little context to it based upon uh, when it was asked. Uh, you mentioned that the only pathway forward doesn't include quantum, or you didn't mention quantum computing when you talked about the right. only pathway forward. Could you comment on that some more? Yeah. Um, so uh, quantum, there's a, a couple of national uh, studies that were done in the last year or so talking about quantum computing, including quantum experts. And the way I read those studies is that we're not going to see quantum computing or in production work until uh, before 2030, I would say. Uh, and, and to keep in mind, this is big science stuff, right? This is zero degrees Kelvin, trucks go by, it disrupts things. So if quantum computing works, it's going to be, you know, mainframes in the cloud. We're not going to have quantum cell phones. So we need to figure out what to do at least between now and 2030. And then, of course, for all the devices that aren't in the cloud, they'll be there. So, and today, you know, because it's operating at zero degrees Kelvin and very sensitive, it's really not very good at input output. So an example of something that a lot of people are excited about is machine learning. Uh, that's get, doing these amazing things that we read about all the time. So machine learning needs two things. It needs machines and a lot of data. So quantum may have powerful machines, but it's, it can't really process a lot of data because it's hard to get it in there today. So it's, I think of quantum computing as the exciting thing for the next decade, but we're gonna have to figure out what to do without Moore's law and Denard scaling until quantum starts to work. And then uh, some new technologies for the more uh, embedded devices. Thanks. Uh, and when we have one more or two more questions, but I'm going to ask him in the same uh, question here. Uh, is there a support role for RISC V? And do you think it'll replace ARM instruction, the ARM instruction set? Uh, it, do, uh, let me do the second one, then I'll ask you what you mean by the first one. Uh, so, in terms of replace, well, you think of it, you know, kind of in history, you know, there are these people who are advocating open source software, both at Berkeley and MIT, and it seemed kind of fuzzy academic. And then, uh, you know, when Linux was created, there was a single operating system and people thought, you know, there were people who thought it was never going to be serious and people thought it was uh, you know, a dangerous idea even. But now Linux uh, is a very popular operating system. However, it hasn't replaced everything. You still see Windows, you still see other operating systems. There's the Apple operating system. So it's a dominant, but it hasn't replaced it. So it's hard to imagine that ARM's going to disappear but like I said, I think it's, you know, if you look at that slide and the seven reasons I had it there, most engineers and companies are going to look at that and say, well, I think I'll, I'll probably use RISC-5. So I expect it to become, you know, a leading, the leading instruction set or the leading instruction set in new products, maybe, uh, starting within the next five years. But I don't think it's, you know, it's going to go disappear. And then in terms of ARM as a company, the thing to keep in mind, is uh, I used to uh, be on Microsoft's academic advisory board and 10 years ago, open source was a dirty word. And, and you, Microsoft would, would literally sue people for who tried to use open source that would run into their patents. Microsoft's a different company today. Microsoft fully embraces open source and it, it even has thrown their patents portfolio in to support open source. So I could easily imagine ARM or Intel deciding to jump on board the, uh, the bandwagon and offer risk, uh, op risk implementations as an addition to the proprietary ones. So I think if there's a, if, you know, if it is commercially successful and, it, and there's ways to make money, I think these companies will, you know, likely join the effort. What was the first question about support? I think you kind of touched on it a little bit. They asked if there was a support role for Risk Five, like Red Hat Linux. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, the the person, it's actually already supported by Red Hat. Uh, that uh, Richard Jones, who was in the video, 
he, he worked for Red Hat. And uh, so RISC V is becoming, you know, is becoming parts of lots of uh, software builds today. It's just one of the, one of the instruction sets that they make sure everything runs on. So that's part of this ecosystem catching up. And I think, Paul, we have time for one more question, and this might be a quick one. Uh, without caching, would RISC be as successful? No, but so would all computers use caches. <laughs> I, I, I think I, you should ask Andre. I would be very hard pressed to find, uh, I get that's not true. It's not true that all computers use caches. You know, 99% of your computers use caches, but there, you know, there are people who uh, do work without caches. Uh, I, I answered my own question. Yeah, <laughs> well, like I said, it was probably a quick answer. Um, with yeah. that, uh, Paul, I'll hand it back over to you. I'd like to thank you, David, for the very interesting talk. It was, it was great. All right, uh, thanks for inviting me. Thanks a lot, David. So I wanted to put up a slide here to show you the uh, way we'll be proceeding today. Uh, next up, we have Mitch Marcus and uh, Jeannie Muckley Calcerano. And then we'll be taking a break at about uh, noon and we'll come back at 1.30 with five more people to speak. <laughs>